Okay, welcome to the EndoSync. It's January 18th. We're going to talk to Aaron. Yeah, let me share my screen. Um, so, does that look all right? Uh, it's, it's sort of kind Zoom of in once. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, um, what I did over the past week or so was I made a no eval secure bundler for endo um this this one sits kind of in between my two previous attempts of making a secure bundler one was um using the existing insecure bundler to just bundle up the archive machinery which is similar to what i'm doing in this one and then the other one was doing the the cess wrapping to achieve a no eval but in the existing bundler uh the problem with this one is that the bundler's runtime is not the same as the compartment mapper. So anytime we add new features to compartment mapper, we need to like re-add them to the bundler. And the problem with the this one is that it does not, uh, it, it's evaluating modules and we want it to not do that for some use cases. Um, so uh, there's some, uh not necessarily out of band but uh things that muddy the diffs in here and that's that we uh there's like getting sas to expose transforms and and some other things that i might want to land separately um and then there's some refactoring that's happening especially like in the archive um but um i think i wanted to show how i did it and ask if that's the right approach and we'll go from there. Um, so inside of the, the bundle, there's now a new make secure bundle. Um, there's some refactorings that I'll skip for now. Um, um, there's right, this out the right out the gate, uh, I think secure might be uh, a first approximation of what we want to express here. I, I don't know. I, I well, it would be good to have Mark to ask, but like by secure, you mean basically self-confined is the, 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 um, this isn't a bundle. This is a, isn't a bundle that you trust from someone else. It's, it's not, it's, it's a bundle that you are vulnerable to if you use it. Um, but uh not vulnerable to if you were the one who created the bundle right is, is that is that a fair characterization yeah i mean our perspective from metamask is that we're creating the bundle and we're scared of what might be inside it um though we don't have policy enforcement in compartment mapper yet and so uh what what, what we have here is not safe uh yeah but the nice part is it uses the compartment mapper machinery so when we land the policy enforcement it's it's going to land in this bundle um cool. but yes referring to the known hard problem of naming things i don't know what to call it yeah and um, we don't have to chase that to the ground in this conversation um so this is the bundle runtime um the let's see uh, i want to go to the bundle file and then we'll come back to this one um so we have the make bundle as before before i broke out this thing called prepare bundle uh which does all the the linking and loading and the, and creation of the compartment map um and then <clears throat> this is pretty much the same um and then we have the make secure bundle so it also calls them to prepare, and it basically creates an archive, um, and mm -hmm. then it just serializes the archive differently. Um, and then we take the module functors. Here, are, we need to do it differently for third, you know, common JS slash third party modules, and the and the pre you know pre compiled ESM modules. But we take their source code and we wrap them in the. Uh, in the expected block. Um, I don't know if we actually need more layers on there for ESM, uh, but that's what we have right now. 
Uh, these, these should suffice for ESM. Okay. Um, and so then inside our bundle, we have the session in lockdown. You know, we could make this parameterize of whether or not it includes it. But for now, we're producing a single blob that has everything you need. So it has a session, calls lockdown, includes the the runtime, the bundle runtime, um, and then it includes uh, the modules and the compartment map and the stuff it needs for the evaluator, like the script strict scope handler. Um, and some helpers and yeah and then it has the the functors which are uh defined in line um okay so then you we already know what looks at what's in sas so if you look at the runtime um we're just exporting this thing called load application and it this is our get function for what would be pulling out of the archive. We're just pulling out of this object. Um, and when we do make archive import hook maker. So we're, we're basically reusing the archive stuff. We just are looked at pulling out the module differently. This does result in some unnecessary uh, serialization because the archive hook is expecting a serialized result that would be a quick refactor away. But, um, these, I don't think we're actually, these are just undefined. So we're not, or at least this one is. So we're not actually doing that check though. I suppose we could, if we want to do. Um, so then our, the main uh, change that's here or the main difference from the archive thing is we have this make import hook which uh, kind of wraps the the archive make import hook and just appends on this thing this this precompiled functor on the module record. Hmm. Um, and so then the we we look for that and use that instead of evaluating the source in the other places and we'll, we can look at that next um and then yeah the rest of it is kind of just normal then we we link normally and expose an execute function then we expose the compartments as well because we need that uh, in the evaluation machinery in order to get the global list for the compartment associated with the module that needs to get the the sys wrap um so i'll just look where we use that real quick that is in um, in module instance. We this is for the make third party module instance. We uh, oh yeah. So the we're defining an execute. This is maybe not the best way to look at this, but we're defining an execute function for this module record. Um, and in for the for the third party module instance, we just call down into the records own execute function. Um, despite this polymorphic call, uh, the execute function defined inside does not have a reference to this. It does it's this value is undefined or null or something. So instead we pulled this off and then pass it in to the execute function. And it, it's fine if it's undefined. Um, uh, I didn't build up enough context around here, so I can do that if you're confused. Uh, this is part of the third party module record. Correct. Um, and so oh. both for that one and for the pre-compiled one, we're defining this execute function. Mm -hmm. And, and this is part of the, uh, um, is yeah is part of a, a module record i guess or it's no it's part of the module instance the module instance has an execute function the third party just kind of passes that execute onto the module records ex execute whereas the uh pre-compiled module instance 
calls compartment evaluate. So mm -hmm. in both these cases, we say, is there a pre-compiled functor? If so, and here in this case, we pass it in. And in this case, we use that instead of doing the compartment evaluate. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a change in SAS. Uh, oh, okay. So the pre-compiled functor isn't a string. It's it's literally a fun. It's it's a function instance. Yeah. That's okay. that's right. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to call it, um, but that is what it is. Functor is right. Functor is certainly okay. consistent. Aaron, this uh, is interesting, but it suggests make pre-compiled bundle. Yes. Um, this could be setting the pre-compiled functor could be like in lava mode we have this feature and it's behind a flag so you can turn it on or off and we use it we use this in uh in metamask so that we can have a csp that says no to eval which is a, a nice security advantage uh, and it's also required in some situations um, if if there's no follow up to this particular location, uh, can we uh, take a look at where linking is happening? Because I remember in archive use case, linking is happening twice when you build the archive and then when you uh, go through the archive to execute it. Uh, and yeah. I didn't catch uh, if it's happening twice in here as well or not. Sure. So the way that's happening in bundle is there's going to be a linking in the bundling phase in preparing the bundle. And so we're doing that in. Uh, so make secure bundles here and we call prepare bundle. And we include this archive only link option and then inside of prepare bundle. Which is used by both the bundlers. Whoop. Um, we are doing a search, doing a compartment map for node modules, making an import hook, doing a link, doing a load. Now we're done. Okay, so, this so this link is the one with, uh, uh, with the option to archive only? Correct. And then, uh, so then the execute uh, function used to have the link as well for the runtime, right? Side of so things. that so that first linking happens there, the, and then the result is a bundle string that we can write to disk or whatever. Um, and then the when we reify that string into JavaScript, we are going to do a link on the other side. Um, so inside a load application, we have a make an import hook, we do a link, and then we execute. Uh, so link is happening before execute. And as far as I remember, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but as far as I remember, link was happening in the execute. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, before link was done inside of execute, I moved it outside because I needed the compartments available before execute begins. And I needed the compartments available in order to uh, do the the CES wrapping. Um, in the CES wrapping, so here's the part you expect to see with the multiple with statements. Mm -hmm. um, we so then we need a we need the the eval kit we need the this value here and so we get that um yeah so, so with this helper function at that time okay yeah mm -hmm. and in order to like get the timing right we have this extra wrapper around the function so uh, we can make this thing this thing gets defined this way and then we get the compartments um and then when we get call execute uh this this gets invoked um which will have a reference to the compartments that that this helper function needs okay so uh my my mental model is shaky at this <laughs> point but it looks like it's uh 
not going to affect the order of things that I depended when <laughs> introducing CommonJS support. So I think CommonJS support is not going to uh, notice the difference. It shouldn't notice the difference, and it's the test verify at least that some part of CommonJS is working as expected. So the the reason why you're confident that policies will work when this merges is because the policy because the machinery for um, because the machinery for uh, for running the bundle is going to be itself bundled in the bundle. Yes. And, um, you know, it's possible that a, a small change will be necessary in order to make sure that the, co the policy comes through. But the, the archive compartment map is a fully serializable POJO. Um, so that goes through via just like a JSON serialize. Mm -hmm. um, and then we... Like we... Yeah, it sounds like the make archive compartment map probably needs to be we probably need to factor that into a shared resource that has a different name that reflects the fact that it's not just being used for archives or not. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe I mean, as a kind of archive, the, the, the bundle really is an archive just in a serial, different serialization format. Um, and the reason why I even needed to change the serialization format was to get the, the pre-compiled functors somewhere else, but maybe I didn't, don't even need to do that. There's an interesting thing that the, well, yeah, you might not need to, or you might need to not do that because uh, in order to appease TypeScript <laughs> or, or just generalize the type so that it, that all, uh, all compartment maps can have the pre-compiled slot on them and then not worry about it. But I think that more in the spirit of the aesthetic of TypeScript would be to have an ancillary data structure with the pre-compiled things that you looked up in a side table, but uh, also not something I care. Well, it's not something that I care deeply about um, because I know I would not be on moral high ground to demand that you do that. <laughs> there are other places where I've already generalized the compartment map in, more, in order that it have properties that are optional and depending on how they're used. Um, I have, yeah, so, so I, I tried a bunch of different things in, in the process of this, and then I ended up just doing, setting the, that pre-compiled functor on the, on the module record, um, and then looking for that and using that instead of evaluation. Uh, but I was also looking at using, um, the parser for language using a custom parser for language dictionary have the parser spit out uh, a thing with a record on it. But I, I noticed that the the third party module record and the precompiled module record were not as um, they didn't rhyme as as well as maybe they could. Like they could both have an execute function on them and have the same arguments prepared to them, and they should internally handle. Uh, what they need, um, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking like, oh, okay, if I just produce a module record that has an execute function that does the right thing, it'll get what it needs to do its job. But we prepare the arguments for those two types uh, very differently inside of SAS. Um, so, so that didn't work. And so I needed to, you know, punch a hole in, in both of those module record types. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. I, I put some things in some notes in bundle runtime. Um, I had to, I repeatedly got extremely confused about the the flow of things, so I put up some like call graph diagrams here, um, and this helped me figure out where records come from. And one thing that I'm not even sure if it's intentional, but it it works uh, that we're currently doing is that. Uh, import archive and it's, you know, make import hook maker. Um, it sets us up. So we're always invoking module record aliases. Uh, we always have a record that includes a static module record that includes a record, which is an alias reference. 
Um, so everything we import includes an alias. I don't know if that's intentional or, or it's just we, we put one record too many inside of the record objects. But that was an observation that was surprising and confusing to me. Um, yeah, I can explain that. This um, happens. Wait, oh, I have a graph to tell me when this happens. Uh, is it the same thing that I experienced where, uh, depending on if it's an archive uh, or, or a regular load, um, some dependencies, no, uh, sorry, between bundler and archive dependencies were uh, loaded in a different order, but that's probably not related. Mm, okay, I can... don't know if that's related, but if the, you know, if there's a difference in the way the import hook is behaving, that could possibly lead to uh, other differing behavior. Um, we have, you know, so I kind of, without much explanation, I put in Slack in, in the hard end uh, MetaMask channel that module record dot static module record dot record. Uh, one, because it's just a funny mouthful, but also because this is what we were doing every time in the um, archive import hook. Um, we, we create that inner record and we wrap it in this thing that ends up being called the static module record. Um, and that's the way parse for, from parser for language returns it. And then we pull off that inner record and we put it in another object which ends up getting called the static module record. Um, and then that ends up in load record, which wraps a module record around the static module record. Um, and because we have, and then, uh, hmm. and then somewhere, uh, Somewhere we look for, you know, and then it's also code that I happen to write at some point. At some point, when we look for a record inside the record, we assume that means it's an alias. Um, having, where yeah, does that happen? Having a record within a record does mean that it's a redirect or alias. Yeah. So we're always doing that for the archive import hook. And my question is, is that intentional? Uh, a, a, a bit of context. Uh, I also noticed that whenever we're um, running an archive, um, when you run the archive, a local modules go through foreign module specifier, uh, which is yeah, not the that's case regular. that's what we're discussing, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh -huh. that uh, uh, what I'm saying is happening in linking. So in, in linking, there's a there's a stage where you check if there's a foreign module specifier in the module descriptor. I think these two things are related. Mm -hmm. So here. We could just return the record, but because we put it inside of here, we end up with an alias. Because and this is on the other side referred to as the static module record, and mm -hmm. then in in uh oh, where was my notes? Lost my notes. I think it was in load record. Which is where is load below record? Is that in source says source module load? Yeah, is in that... terms of making the nomenclature make more sense, static module record will in the future be called module source, and uh, a third party static module record will in the future be referred to as a virtual module source. And there might be two varieties of those things, depending on whether you're trying to emulate JavaScript or something else. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's a type union of static of of module source types, um, and in the and the module descriptor is also a tagged union, <laughs> and it's the module descriptor that has a variation for whether it 
uh, for aliases. So, so really, like, I, I want to make sure that it's clear that it's a that the aliasing is happening at the layer of a module descriptor, and the virtualization is happening on the on the level of the of the module source. And at the moment, the naming is confusing because <laughs> because naming is hard. Uh, <laughs> the uh yeah the thing that is called the static module record is probably um probably needs to receive a tentative variable name and then a more and then be reassigned without modification to different variable names whenever um whenever it's whenever its nature becomes more clear um right so if you have a if you have a module descriptor and then you have like, well, if this module descriptor is of this particular shape, the first thing you should do is, re is give it a new name that is entirely for the purposes of the, of uh, making it clearer for the reader of the program. It serves no other purpose. And I did not, I do not think I did that as pervasively as I ought to have. I see Michael unmuted. Yeah. Um, so I was curious. The, the original intent of static module record was all the information we can glean from the module statically. Yes, that remains true. And how would module source be the same? Uh, it's literally a rename. Module source. I know. So, uh, but it, you're, you're saying that a third party or a virtual module source is a different thing because a virtual I, I, I guess I don't understand what the third party module record is right now. Yeah, the uh, virtual module sources are, are the, a protocol that the module constructor will accept in the place of a module source for implementing languages that are not JavaScript or for implementing JavaScript virtually. Um, and it's a virtual module source is what you get from um, the uh, from from compiling common JS, among other things. The mm. uh, it, it's a it's it is it is spiritually the same as, in as a module source uh, or as a concrete an actual module source. Uh, in the sense that it is reusable and contains no mutable state. Okay. Okay. And and that's just because you have a different mapping of source to or how yeah, the module it, namespaces are derived it has to be done in a different way. That's what I understand. Yeah. 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 So it, okay. it doesn't have any state. It's just an expression. It's an object that expresses its bindings, what it imports and exports and re-exports. Um and also has an execute function that defines its behavior. The execute okay. function receives as it's in its arguments, the uh, um, the the internal view of the namespace that it's supposed to modify by its execution. Okay, so that, um, then that as, would make well Aaron's proposed stuff. change Aaron's proposed change to make the execute functions have the same arguments would make more sense in this in this way. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit, but having oh, okay. uh, that you're breaking uh, yeah, up I, a little bit, but I think I understood the spirit of your question. So I think I can say that yes, um, having a module source source that contains a precompiled execution, a precompiled execute function, um, would be spiritually similar. It's, but the protocol is, as Aaron mentioned, yeah, it's it's similar in the sense that it's uh, a calling convention. It's 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 just that it's a precompiled function instead of having uh, an execute function that receives arguments. That uh, the the trouble is that the execute function um, assumes that you're going to use the compartment evaluate um, in order to affect the behavior of the underlying actual source. Um, and mm. in this particular case, you're not going to have access to the evaluator, but you can compile. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks. So, that's that's so context that, I really need to help assess this stuff going forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like, uh, 
Yeah, so it's a it's a new module source protocol for bundles, essentially. Um, and and Aaron, you've set it up so that you get a precompile. You get a precomp. Uh, so parse for language gives you an object that you could use with the compartment, but basically you're going to get vestigial code inside of the bundle, code that will never execute because it's not going down the eval path. Um, you're intercepting that early and just executing the pre-compiled execute function. That's right. So in order to be, you know, to be careful with bundle size, we can make sure that the the strings, the source strings are not appended. And I think we're doing that now. Um, but the code that says compartment evaluate is still going to be there, even though we don't use it. There might be a way to factor it in a way that doesn't. Uh, it would be it would be nice to find a factoring that does not include dead code. But uh, again, I think you're generally going in the right direction. Yeah, I kind of wanted uh, the that execution logic to either like all be in module instance or all be in the module records. And one is in one and one's in the other. And so that was, and then they have different arguments. So um, the based on the name, pre-compiled module, that sounds like what I want. And based on the, the arguments or based on the way it calls on execute on the record makes me think, oh, that's the one I want. But because the arguments are prepared differently, I wanted both of those things one for esm one for cjf and i couldn't just treat them all as pre-prepared so for um what's the calling convention can you show me a mm -hmm. site where you're calling yeah. the pre-compiled the comp uh, pre-compiled module like whatever module function uh-huh yeah it's in um uh module instance over in sas and then i think i'll just look at this file because it's a mess otherwise um so the uh, okay, so over in CES. okay yes what are we looking at here this is a make third-party module instance prepares a module instance that has an execute function um the execute function just realized a, a call to execute here and it provides uh, these arguments, proxied exports, compartment, resolved imports. But um, for make module instance, this is the pre-compile, this is the ESM one. Um, it does a lot more preparation of arguments. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more. A lot, a lot, a lot more before um calling that functor with these things and mm -hmm. i well i was in a previous attempt i was trying to prepare these myself myself based on what's passed in but it's uh insufficient there's like things from get deferred exports that aren't exposed to you um there's some compartment fields that are necessary um there's you, you just don't get what you need from the third party one in order to prepare the arguments for the ESM one. Yes, that's expected. Yeah, that's expected. Okay. So that that becomes the design constraint for making these have similar APIs or or something. Okay, so uh, but the these are wired directly into the output of uh, the transform that SES does on ESM sources. So uh, we either need an intermediary that would translate uh, between imports once for in life bar and whatever we actually want as an API, or we need to uh, change the structure in there to something else that is less uh, ESM specific. Uh, I think the, the second option is really not an option <laughs> because that would mean uh, generating a bunch of runtime code in front of each module. And this current once we're in life bar uh, is fairly small 
in comparison to what we would need to put there. So I, I have trouble uh, understanding the design constraints here because I don't understand the like security and trust model of this part of SAS. Um, the, you know, like there's, there's all these things that like, okay, so if we take all the compartment fields and we take all the deferred exports objects and uh, I, I don't know what all those things are uh, in, in their fullness. And if we just pass them into the thing that prepares the arguments for the functor, it seems like it would work great. But I don't know if it's safe to do that, right? Are we passing in like module shim transforms or I don't know, like, is that, are we crossing compartment boundaries? <laughs> like, I don't, I, re I don't know what the, the model is here. So it's confusing. Yeah, the idea is that any user, any given bundle should not be able to mess with the internals of the, the imports stack. So we do want, we do want a, a defined interface there that is fairly tightly controlled for ESM at least. Yeah. So we have, but have in, faith that a, a functor can escape to somewhere else. But in this case, the one that we're passing all these potentially powerful arguments to is the uh, it's like a the parser bundle. for language. Yeah. And the parser for language is part of the like system configuration, like the runtime configuration. So it seems like that so, part's got to be trusted. So um, the functor in this case is constructed inside of a compartment using evaluate. You type uh, this one. Yeah. See compartment evaluate on 454. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're getting, well, that is what guarantees that, that, that is what in this case guarantees that the, that the module body is confined. Right. No, I uh, understand that, that part. But um, I think, you know, like I think we can generalize these module instance types. Yeah. We... So let's, let's, let's do a thought experiment. The idea is that we want to be able to um, pre-compile the functor, the, that functor. Um, such that SES trusts that that is a confined functor. And we need to do that in a way that does not break the confinement rules for systems that are not running under a no eval policy. Um, so, um, so if we were to revise the protocol so that there were a new, so if, or if we were to refactor this in such a way that there was essentially a new third party module record type that had a trusted pre-compiled functor on it, um, we would need to do that in a way that doesn't allow an untrusted functor to get executed and escape confinement I, in the cases where it's not running under no eval. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can, um, can code that should be evaluated inside a compartment return module records and that sort of thing? I'm sorry. So be because the, the module record influences how the linkage works from other modules, it's a bit too powerful to allow it to, to allow, say, an ESM module to express things that might not be possible in ESM, if that makes any sense. Uh, you lost me in the last word. Not possible to express an ESM. So this code was inherited from way back when, when, um, when Mark basically sketched out the ESM semantics and a way of, of designing the functors so that it required a, a very simple transformation, it just didn't just strip out the imports and exports, and then it's plain JavaScript again. Mm -hmm. um, The idea behind the static module record was to 
allow the linkage side to be able to to express the relationships between stuff without giving power to the functor at all. So you don't need to invoke the functor, you don't need to do anything with the functor, and then the functor's behavior will always conform to the, the metadata that you gathered from it. Mm -hmm. So as the functor grows up into something that has has more trust placed on it, like the pre-compiled functor. Um, how do we still preserve that that property that we're not? We know for a fact that we're not allowing the the the, the functor to modify what its imports or exports are. For example, that that right. that's expressed only directly in the source code. Yes. So the my, my understanding is that because the definition of the functors is set up using the like i don't know using the the system that you're already relying on that part is is trustworthy but then it is just the property dangling on the module record is that part trustworthy and so is there uh, one of my questions to inspect that is, is can code that's evaluated in a compartment somehow connect with the, the loading and linking and execution machinery and like return a module record that it has, it has prepared itself? Uh, probably not because it only has access to uh the namespace that's already created and right, frozen. Right. yeah so in, any even if it could say like oh you need to execute this module record and it had a pre-compiled functor that functor can only be defined in inside the compartment or whatever the compartment had access to so it's not an increase in power yeah, I might be convinced of that uh, it isn't an increase in power. And again, uh, to, to Michael's concern, it's already the case that um, we, for agoric production concerns, in order to get this into the endo zip base 64 thing to work in prod for us, we had to decouple um, the static module record layer, the compiler um, from the runtime in a way that the runtime did not require. Um, we had to introduce pre we had to introduce the concept of a pre-compiled static module record and frame it in a way that uh, that would work for CES at runtime. And I think that one of the effects of that, okay, so one of the effects of that is that I had to expose uh, a dunderbar function uh, on evaluate you see the uh 457 module shim lexicals uh i had to add a power to the evaluate function that was sort of a neat nudge nudge wink wink don't use this it doesn't break safety but if you were to write production code that depends upon this it would not be portable to a native implementation of cess mm -hmm. and so that the, the so it's the case is sort of like static module records are pre-compiled and dumped into a JSON format in archives um, that then gets evaluated in this way. It's already the case that because of this, you can create languages that are more expressive than ESM um, and run them in, and, and safely run them inside of inside of CES. I, or it might be worth examining whether it's actually still safe. <laughs> Uh, in greater detail but i uh if it if that is safe then it should be safe to allow for a pre-compiled functor um on the premise again that a confined program would not be able to create an unconfined functor it's not it doesn't have access to a lexical scope that's not confined so the a problem here too is that unless we're trusting the rewrite um and imposing the rewrite then a functor that runs within the magic eight lines or whatever it has 
still has access to dynamic import, for example. You can break uh, confinement right. from within the bundle and your your all bets are off at that point. Yes. Yes. So it should be performing these transforms, uh, but it may not be. So that's something that we can test or. It is certainly a responsibility of the bundler. And I think that you're doing this. You are running the censorship transforms um, that would prevent access to dynamic import. Uh, I'm not certain that I am. <laughs> no, because it's part of compartment evaluate. It's not part of anything else. Yeah. The evasive transform, sorry. Or just yeah, import it, it, compartment yeah, evaluate. Uh, yeah, for make confined, make self-confined bundle needs to take on the responsibility of censoring dynamic import among and all of the censorship transforms in CES since it's not going to be evaluating them. It's also, uh, b b while it's on my mind, uh, uh, another piece of feedback was be that it would be good to decouple CES so that the user is obliged to inject CES separately from the bundle. Um, because that and would allow provide for... options to lock down. Yes. I think for the, the lockdown customization, um, I mean, we can we can parameterize it and, and throw it in there. But I, I was thinking primarily just parameterizing, including lockdown and CES or not. And I, you know, like in in uh, in MetaMask, we, we already include it separately. Um, and so I would expect when I use this to do the same. For uh, I heard CES doesn't like being in a bundle. Cess could be in the bundle, but I think that it's more flexible. It's more flexible for end users if it's not part of the bundle, because you could conceivably have multiple bundles on the same page execute and yep. uh, and, and I having, expect to do exactly that. Yeah, and having to call, having lockdown called multiple times is not good. Uh, it wouldn't work. So I also like the option of having it all included because it's nice having just like, oh, I want to bundle the thing and yeah. have everything I need. Um, if that's the case, then let's consider having just an option and have it be an opt-in to have the whole. I, I think opt-in is the right decision, but um, welcome to feedback on that point. Um we don't have uh, a lot of time let's... left and I want to do uh, yeah. policies, but I'll risk derailing everything and just mention that uh, we will would still need to tackle, even if we go through all of these steps, we would still need to tackle how different ESM and CJS are in terms of what needs to go into the functor. Uh, so you're getting code. And one code assumes there's the module and exports global variables and uh, Dunderbar, dear name and stuff. And the other one is assuming whatever the transform uh, generates it to assume. Uh, and these are vastly different. So some sort of runtime uh, function that would translate from a shared API uh, to that uh, would be necessary anyway. I think. Otherwise, we would need to uh, put that in the functor source itself. Uh, are we talking about creating a generalized virtual module source that's suitable for all languages? The... I, I think so. And, and the, one of the reasons, one of the motivating reasons for this is because I wanted to put that um, the pre-compiled functor. I wanted to just put it in the, the parser for language implementation. So our bundle would have a custom version of that. And that's where we handled that. And we wouldn't have to worry about it in normal SAS usage. Um, but that wasn't an option because the arguments are prepared differently. I mean, it's certainly possible to frame a common JS binding in terms of the static module record calling convention. We, we haven't done that, but we could. Uh, so I did something similar, but on a different uh, layer uh, in 
where I introduced CommonJS support to the existing bundler, the uh, insecure That's bundler. Right. That's <laughs> right. Do you want to call it that now? <laughs> we, we, should, oh, we, should, we should certainly call it something. We the bootstrap bundler. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so the bootstrap bundler CJS support. It has uh, two modules that uh, work as adapters. Uh, and I put some effort, not going to say it was a lot, but I put some effort into making sure I don't generate a lot of text uh, to uh, adopt the calling conventions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I propose as a worthy experiment would be to, re to refactor compartment mapper in place such that all of the languages are implemented in terms of the static module record, the ESM calling convention. Um, I think that diminishes the value of the compartment mapper a little bit in terms of vetting virtual module sources as a language feature, but um, but that's not actually all that useful to us at the moment because that feature is um, very much in flux. Yeah. That would simplify the compartment mapper in this cases and these cases. Uh the yeah, and I think that we need to have Mark on the call and do a thorough thought <laughs> a, 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 a deep dive on whether that small change to Cess to admit the pre-compiled um module functors is safe. Um my intuition is that it is safe and I, my intuition is also that michael is correct that it allows confined code to express languages that are more free than esm and we might not be happy with the status quo in that regard um on that note we are short on time and zb you do have a topic so uh let's let's revisit this aaron i think uh, to answer your question i think you're running in the correct direction cool i i just i don't know what to do next I mean, like I can clean up these things and I can add these tests, but uh, those are. Yeah. Uh, maybe we call in another meeting with Mark and um, I'm not sure about next steps either. Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to throw something in here. Um, for those of you who, and that includes everybody who knows that Chris may disappear very quickly for any reason. So you, say again? Uh, you may disappear for, for child related reasons in any, at any time coming. I, I'm sorry, Michael, what was the question? So the, Chris, Chris the may disappear. Yes, <laughs> everybody knows Chris may disappear. Um, it's, it's officially my, my uh, assignment to look after Seth while he's gone. And mostly that means just making sure that we're not blocking you on anything. So I don't expect to be taking on a bunch of new development or anything. But uh, as long as you need somebody as a sounding board, uh, and I've kind of been around the code base for a while, um, I'm happy to have you guys work and do your own PR approvals for each other if you need to, or if you need opinions on things, I'll try to give them. But aside from that, I guess Mark and Richard is here too. Um, we'll just make sure you get connected to the right people. We'll assess what Chris is on. Yeah, and it's, and it's great. It's great that you're investigating this particular problem because Michael is especially well informed about the static module record implementation. <laughs> uh, to be clear, I didn't write it. <laughs> Yeah, ZB. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and be quick uh, about it. So uh, in case you didn't read my uh, Slack messages much, uh, the implementation that I demoed last week, um, it had a flaw where uh, it was a bit naive uh, and trusted uh, the specifier 
in linking, and the specifier in linking is actually coming from the source code of uh, the package itself. So the issue was, and I'm going to dig up a test for that um, in here somewhere. Yes, there is a, there is a package. Yeah. Uh, convention suggests it's the Mallory package. So I'm using the feature that Aaron implemented uh, where I can say uh, that this uh, module is instead uh, going to load this. So uh, what I now want to do is with, uh, there's, a, there's a test that's trying that out. Uh, so in this situation, I want to uh, import Mallory and let Mallory uh, import Dan. But then if Mallory gets updated uh, to uh, load something else instead of Dan, uh, I want it to be prevented. Uh, so I needed to figure out that something else is being loaded as Dan. And that's the error message I'm expecting here. But to fulfill that, I needed to change the compartment map uh, to include, um, where is it? Here, to include a unfal unfalsifiable ID of what is being loaded. So uh, instead of trusting uh, the place where the information is coming from in linking, I need uh, the modules list on the uh, compartment descriptor to contain modules that represent where they're coming from. Um, and that means uh, for Dan in that example, so in, in modules, there's Dan, uh, which contains uh, the compartment module and policy ID that says Hackity. Um, which uh, allows me to then verify things um, much later. So the policy uh, implementation now is going to look up um, in here. Yeah, so if this is not an exit module, uh, we will uh, look up modules of specifier, uh, check its policy ID. Uh, as the key that we're using uh, in policy. And as soon as I implemented that and got it to initially work, uh, I noticed that uh, I can do it much earlier. Um, at a tiny cost that uh, I still don't like, but uh, since I'm already... Uh, checking things in here in node modules. Actually, I'm gonna switch uh, sharing to the implementation that I already did. So uh, now another version in node modules, what I can do is uh, grab the policy, put it in, uh, generate the policy ID, and then I implemented trim modules by policy where I'm checking the policy uh, at the, the time of building the graph here. Uh, and the compartment is only getting modules that it's uh, actually supposed to be allowed to get, which is uh, very nice because it trims away uh, a lot of stuff and makes the, the final result uh, smaller than before, uh, but has a drawback of if I can scroll back to an example of it somewhere. Now it's gonna be easier to find it in tests. Um, the tests that you saw before, test dash policy here, uh, no longer know, I no longer know that the original uh, module was called Hackity. So uh, I can only now say importing Dan was not allowed by policy, even though the policy says Dan true, because it actually attempted to import Hackity, but that was not even in the modules list. So I'm losing that information uh, at 
later time at link time to be precise uh, but I'm gaining a lot of nice uh, stuff so I'm torn here and I don't know which path to take because uh, figuring out uh, what was aliased uh, as Dan at the time of generating the error is going to be hard so I would need to preserve some sort of information about that or learn where to get it at runtime maybe uh but i don't think it's available now and but this yeah, is the only drawback of this and i'm uh I, I can move all the package graph uh policy enforcement into compartment map building i think this is a good approach and to make the error better would require threading dependence uh would require threading breadcrumbs so that you can produce an error that says, hey, I couldn't give you this because you asked for that, because you mm -hmm. asked for this, because you asked for that. Um, it's a bit of a pain, but it's very worthwhile. Users love that <laughs> when, <laughs> when their errors contain yeah. breadcrumbs. Um, yeah. So I think in terms of like design approach, you're uh, having the having the node modules graph produce the policy IDs is is a good approach uh so uh, wait and also both of them are producing the ids but the the one that you're looking at now is using them in place in node modules.js and then uh never persisting persisting them for later uh right in yeah in any case so, so you, you'd say it's erasing it's erasing the aliases or uh, erasing the, no, 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 the right verb is, is attenuate, uh, where, where you're using the word trim. Attenuate is the correct verb. You have an object and you're removing properties of it. It's it's like, uh, like trim is- Not trim. really, it's, it's <laughs> trimming the list of uh, modules uh, that uh, should not end up being imported anyway. This is what it's doing. Uh, I maintain that attenuates the right verb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what I'm uh, doing here is I'm, uh, uh, and, and this deserves a rewrite elsewhere, but uh, it was easier to not re uh, refactor node modules too much. Uh, but I'm getting rid of the policy ID that I just created before uh, mm -hmm. because it will no longer be needed. Mm -hmm in the compartment map. So as soon as I get rid of things that would not be allowed to get imported, uh, I can clean it up. Um, and then still uh, would need to thread some breadcrumbs in there. I don't... The policy ID end up in the compartment map for good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you're filtering on line 72. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fil uh, yeah. This yeah. is where the filtering happens. Right. Yeah. So trim for strings, filter for arrays, and attenuate for objects, I think, is the idea. Um, okay. The, uh, not, that, not that it matters that much. I think if, <laughs> if anything ended up in the language, it would not be called attenuate. It would be something like whatever, whatever underscore decided the thing should be called um pluck or the unpluck anti-pluck i don't know uh, <laughs> uh in any case yeah this is a good direction i i like everything but some specific nits about colors i um don't want to do an extended rant but i hate the word id and find clever ways of never using it <laughs> <laughs> in this particular case, you could probably just use the name policy in the same way. That um, I, I'm, I'm going saying... to get rid of that part because I'm creating it uh, in one place and consuming it in another. And I can instead uh, implement uh, something that instead of generating it here uh, is going to uh, just process these things differently uh, in place and policy ID is going to become entirely internal to the policy JS file at this point. 
encapsulation win awesome love it let's yeah. do it sounds good yeah uh, and then error handling <laughs> uh, so maybe i can uh i can do some sort of uh internal weak map trickery to to do it but yeah I'll, yeah I'll think about it but um yeah so uh we no longer have time uh can we stretch uh, a bit more because i have one more question about the direction where we would go mm -hmm. okay and this is about uh scope so uh what i have now is something that uh, resembles the lava mode policy a lot. I got rid of the attenuators list because I'm extracting them uh, from the policy itself. And uh, I have a tiny memoization in there so that I don't have to do it many times, assuming the policy might be big. Never mind. Uh, what I want to establish is the scope of what we're going to deliver um, as the first thing that gets merged into uh, the, the main branch. And I'm not entirely sure about these uh, top level names for a package policy. Globals, packages, and built-in are uh, more specific to the LavaMote use case than necessary for Endo uh, because built-in actually means exit module mm -hmm. in this case. So mm -hmm. uh, should we come up with new names? <laughs> because no. this is how things get linked or available. This is exit modules uh, and globals uh, might stay the same. I think so. built-in is a better word to surface to the user. Uh, uh, that's that's a different thing so uh mind that uh we are creating an api for endo to consume policy but the producer of this policy shape uh is not necessarily the end user uh so aaron uh has always wanted uh more human readable policies so that we could say dot env uh, and uh, only list uh, capabilities like say uh, file system os and uh, process uh, or environment variables and that would be processed by something else that just reads the text and generates uh, what endo is willing to consume so we would have here policy uh, translate mm. from and we can write any human readable thing we want to and that translates into uh, a low level policy with all the details and then again error handling uh, would not have anything reasonable to output for that but uh, yeah let's solve that later uh, we need an API uh, to present yeah. these three categories to Endo uh, in a way that means something to the lower level Endo user. Yeah, I um, I I feel like I would not block any PR based off of the choice that you make for the name of this property. I I think that they're both good and and trust your judgment. The okay. uh, like exits, I think, communicates. Exits is jargony. I think it 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 it, okay. it plays Extra. well with. The, yeah, right. External is good. These are things that are external to the bind to the bundle, but they might be implemented in some other bundle. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's something. Uh, I really wanted to change built-in into something else for one reason. These two are plural, this one's not. <laughs> you don't want to know how many times I debugged what I wrote because I uh, put built-ins as a key instead of built-in in some place somewhere. Yeah, if you have it in for inconsistency of plurality, I'm uh, you, you have my support. Even this if is, that is this is correct, but uh, not 
as intuitive as I would want to. No, I agree. I hate that. I have. Uh, <laughs> there was a there was a style guide law at Uber that one of my coworkers perpetrated that all package names must be framed in singular regardless. <laughs> <laughs> and it it helps it genuinely helps to have a rule like that so you don't have to guess okay so it would say externals in oh. that case <laughs> oh so i see i now see the attraction to exits <laughs> <laughs> i see yeah externals is is weird um hmm Built-in is an adjective here. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I know that, and that's why it's correct. Uh, but it's uh, super hard to not forget that. <laughs> or maybe it's just me. Like I, no, 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 no. It's not just you. Um, I have to just talk, thing. so. Thanks, I'm folks. Sorry. I have to drop yeah. right now, so see you later. Okay. See you soon. See you. It's not just you. Uh, there's a saying that simplicity is not simplicity. It was consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. I every time I remember this idiom, I feel like yes, I have a little mind, and yes, I have a hobgoblin, and yes, you get to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, in the respect, in respect for people with little minds who do not care to memorize the detail of which things are plural and singular in a single bag, I, uh, I, I would not object to exits. I wouldn't object to anything still, but I, I understand your argument and wouldn't object to exits. Okay. Uh, Aaron, uh, you have any thoughts on what to name these things? Yeah, the it uh, exits is not obvious if you're approaching this as a net node developer. Um, I don't know if making it more specific is helpful. Like, I don't know how general we're trying to be. Would we expect this to work as is if we dropped it on Dino? Um, would do we so do we want a policy name that's sufficiently yes. general that it works for uh, both platforms so uh mm. these things uh listed here uh are if you if you disregard attenuation for a moment uh but these things uh are uh, literally coming from here so whatever we want to rename modules to we should mm. find a, a sibling name for that field. Well, I don't mind external and externals. I, I don't, I'm not put off that much by externals. What if we renamed both to externals? Yeah, that's, that's good. But I would keep it singular in the policy. <laughs> I, I so don't want to. I wouldn't. I and and I'm sympathetic to ZB's cause. I I wouldn't. I would keep them consistent. Okay. Um, so I know I can come up with anything for this, but am I allowed to change this? Uh, as long as you don't break anything, that's a breaking change. So. Uh, or it would be a breaking change unless you have a built-in uh, deprecation path where you accept both the old and the new name, which I, which isn't hard. You could do that. Okay. Mo yeah, modules is part of the public API of the compartment. Um, and it's mm. analogous to the modules argument of the compartment constructor which is the second argument yeah. of the compartment constructor. Uh, what about... We can afford making it longer and we wouldn't have because... to change this. 
We could call it Biltons. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, Bilt Biltons is actually kind of fair because, as 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 Aaron points out, that's the one. That's the word that people will understand. Um, well, if, but they don't have to be Biltons. You can pass modules from a different. Uh, oh, I know. Assembly. I know. But I know, but they're built in to the from the perspective of guest code. They're they're host modules to guest code. Hmm. I'm leaning on built-ins. I think that built-ins is probably. Well, it, it achieves one thing of adding the letter S. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, it, it, it achieves the other thing, Not too, much. that, it, that it, it would make sense in the broader scope for, like, if something like this became more standards track. It would communicate the intent more clearly to end users, I think. At the expense of being somewhat confusing to persnickety folks about who think about virtual built-ins versus host built-ins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, I'm going to drop off. Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh... We're going to do that too, I suppose. But yeah, thanks for confirming which way uh, sounds better. And I'm going to continue doing this because this is uh, the, uh, this uh, move from linking to compartment map building uh, happened today morning. So it's still <laughs> quite fresh. Yeah, um, to that end, I can easily imagine. So the thing about the node modules thing is that it's coupled to node. And compartment maps are not coupled to node, and the transforms that you're that we do the transforms that we do on compartment maps in the archiver, and the transforms that we're doing to compartment maps as a side as as a post processing step in the node modules tree, those are all like logically separable things that I can imagine refactoring out if we ever needed to bind to. Um, a different source of modules than the node modules tree. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just keep that uh, in mind. There might be a separable, a concern that can be separated, especially for something like applying policies to compartment maps that were divine yeah. not off. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of things to uh, potentially separate out, uh, but uh, I would like to first ship a working policy thingy. Yeah. So that it can be adapted into other stuff like the secure bundler, and then uh, yep. go crazy with the internals without breaking uh, the compatibility much. I agree. Sounds good. Okay. A bit over time. Yeah, just a little. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Help. Yeah. See ya.